Sauropods are a mystical and ancient group, often drawing the wonder of people all over the world. They were the largest animals to have lived on land that we know of, and existed on nearly every continent worldwide. They were an incredibly successful group of dinosaurs and would have been the dominant animals nearly everywhere that they roamed. Except for a large portion of the Cretaceous, they vanished from North America. But in time, one titan arose from out of nowhere after sauropods had disappeared here for over 30 million years, Alamosaurus. Its arrival changed the ecosystems where it appeared, with one scientist saying it brought back a very Jurassic aspect to Cretaceous North America. Let's try to understand what happened to the sauropods here and where Alamosaurus may have come from. As some of you may know, time periods are typically broken up into pieces. The Cretaceous is broken up into two main pieces, the Early Cretaceous and the Late Cretaceous. The Early Cretaceous consists of the Bariasian to the Albion stages, and the Late Cretaceous consists of the Cenomenian to the Mastrichtian. We are going to be looking at about 104 million years ago, during the Cenomenian, which is where our event takes place. In the fossil record, sauropods begin to disappear from North America, with one of the last being the Brachiosaurid known as Abetosaurus. Another of the last sauropods before their disappearance was Sauroposidon, an earlier titanosauriform from the group known as Somphospondyli, who also went extinct during this time. It's thought that both Sauroposidon and Abetosaurus were some of the last sauropods in North America prior to their disappearance. With the sauropods disappearance, this time period of the Cretaceous in North America is known as the sauropod hiatus. Now there are two main theories behind why they were thought to have disappeared. The first, and the less likely of the two, is that sauropod fossils following this time period were just poorly preserved. While certainly not impossible, sauropods tend to leave some more evidence behind, whether in the form of footprints or even just partial fossils. This theory does go further, however, explaining sauropods may have begun to favor upland environments as the western interior seaway began to cut a swath across the land, which changed the landscape. The more likely scenario is that typical North American sauropods simply went extinct. Abetosaurus was the last North American brachiosaurid that we have record of, and Sauroposidon was a Samphospondyli, making them an earlier relative of the later titanosaurs like Alamosaurus, albeit somewhat separated. And they were actually fairly closely related to brachiosaurids as well, as they're all part of the titanosaur forms. Sauroposidon is the youngest sauropod known before the hiatus, and after them, sauropods seem to simply disappear from the North American fossil record. Currently, it is more widely believed that these sauropods went extinct following Sauroposidon or migrated southwards or westwards, which would explain their disappearance. Some scientists believe that hadrosaurs may have contributed to the hiatus as well. While it's not believed that they were the direct cause, a pair of scientists, Michael Diemek and Brady Foreman, consider the ideas of young hadrosaurs and young sauropods may have competed for food at their juvenile stages, and thus increasing competition could have driven the sauropods south or to extinction. This theory is kind of supported by the fossil record, as the disappearance of sauropods somewhat coincides with the rise of North American hadrosaurs. However, we aren't certain on this, and it needs further study to be certain. Regardless of what happened, it's clear that sauropods were no longer present in North America for millions of years. During this time, all across the world, sauropods still thrived nearly everywhere, save Europe, where they were almost as scarce. They were especially thriving in the Southern Hemisphere, in places like Africa and South America. As sauropods disappeared from North America, the titanosaurs, a newer group, began to take over. Titanosaurs are among the least well-preserved sauropods, and their titanic size has made many species contested and confusing over the years. These animals reached absolutely massive sizes, and the oldest known one is Ninja Titan from modern-day Brazil. Unfortunately, these massive animals' origins are shrouded in mystery. Titanosaurs can be found on nearly every continent, so that begs the question, where did they come from? In my opinion, the most likely explanation is that they originally came from Gondwana, one of the previous continents separate from Laurasia, the northern continent at the time. From here, as these continents broke apart, it probably split the titanosaurs apart, eventually creating two distinct lineage for each side of the world. It should be noted that Asian titanosaurs may have crossed into the Americas as well, but this is a lot less likely, because the Bering Land Bridge, which they could have crossed over, was a very high environment and not suitable for sauropods. It should also be noted that during this time, North America had become divided in two by a shallow sea known as the Western Interior Seaway, and Almosaurus ventured into the westernmost of those continents, Laramidia. While the titanosaurs spread all across the eastern half of the world with even some small species like Megirosaurus in Europe, the South American animals mostly populated just that, South America. This is where some of the largest sauropods like Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan lived and thrived, and it's currently thought that here is where Alamosaurus came from. 
Around 70 million years ago, during the Maastrichtian age of the Cretaceous, South America was filled with an abundance of species, including titanosaurs like Ostraposeidon and Dreadnoughtus. It was thought that during or just before this time that a bridge had once again formed between North and South America. When and where this occurred is not well known, but it provides the most likely explanation as to Alamosaurus's migration north. Alamosaurus can mostly be found in the southern parts of what would one day become the United States and Mexico. Meanwhile, it is also thought that during this time as Alamosaurus moved north, North American hadrosaurs began to venture into South America. Alamosaurus has a fairly long history, with the original specimen being discovered in 1921 by a man named Charles Gilmore in what is modern-day New Mexico. Now, contrary to popular belief, this animal was not named after the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, as the animal wasn't found there at this time. Instead, it was named such because of the Ojo Alamo trading post and the geological formation of the same name, and they were given their name by Gilmore as well. The original specimen is just a few pieces of the animal, including its shoulder, and more fossil material would be described by Gilmore in 1946. More and more material would be discovered all across the southern United States in the following years, with the fairly well-preserved juvenile being discovered in 2002. These new specimens, combined with our ever-growing understanding of sauropods over time, have let us understand this behemoth a little bit better. They were absolutely massive, with adults currently thought to reach up to 85 feet or 26 meters in length and weigh over 40 tons. Earlier estimations, as with most sauropods, had them at even more massive sizes, nearly 100 feet long and double their weight at 80 tons. However, as our understanding of sauropods deepened, we understand that these animals had incredible adaptations to lighten their load, so to speak. Sauropods all have pneumaticized bones, like birds, meaning that they are denser but hollow and filled with small struts for support. This allows their bones to be both lightweight but also strong at the same time, albeit on a much grander scale than birds. It's actually funny, because in the past, this bird-like tendency was noted quickly in paleontology, as a pterosaur named Ornithopsis was discovered to be a sauropod, and the name had to be kept due to the rules of zoological nomenclature. It's a, it's a whole thing. Aside from that, sauropods also had a system of air sacs in their body, allowing their neck to be even more lightweight and transfer air directly to their lungs for more efficient breathing. This understanding has de-sized a lot of sauropods, giving them new weights to coincide with our new understanding. Regardless, Alamosaurus was a titanic animal and quickly became the dominant herbivore in the southern parts of North America. These animals had several adaptations that assisted them, including osteoderms that were assigned to this species, giving them another close connection to their South American titanosaurs. Like they do for ankylosaurs, osteoderms would have granted them fantastic protection and younger animals would have needed it coming into this new environment. Gone was the South American predators that they had grown used to, which mostly consisted of abeli swords by this stage of the Cretaceous, as most of the Carcharodontosauridae were thought to have gone extinct by this point in time. If not for their sheer size and those osteoderms, they may have been unprepared for their new threat, the Tyrannosaurs. While adults may have been safer overall from T. rex and its relatives, they were still powerful animals and likely their only real predator. It's thought that these titanic sauropods inhabited inland plains, and while a complete skull has never been found, many teeth belonging to them have, showing that they had rod-shaped teeth. This would have allowed them a broader feeding range, able to eat a majority of the plants found in the north, including flowering plants, cycads, and even the tougher plants like conifers. This diversity of food may have also assisted them in their dominance, even though they share territory with an abundance of animals. These include several ceratopsians like Eotriceratops, Taurosaurus, Bravoceratops, and Ojoceratops. However, the last two have been semi-contested, with Ojoceratops thought to represent a synonym of Eotriceratops, and Bravoceratops thought to not be distinct enough from relatives like Sierraceratops. However, subsequent studies have considered Bravoceratops to be a valid and distinct species once again, even though it's kind of up in the air currently. A hadrosaurid also lived here as well, named Cretosaurus. Cretosaurus lends its name to its family, the Cretosaurini, a subfamily of group known as Sorolophine hadrosaurs. They are known from a skull and partial remains, and were a fairly large hadrosaur overall, but likely would have eaten different plant material than Alamosaurus. A notosaurid ankylosaur known as Glyptodontopelta is also known to have lived alongside Alamosaurus. However, not much is known about this animal either. They are only known from isolated osteoderms and a very incomplete skull. Tyrannosaurs are known to have coexisted alongside Alamosaurus, but most Tyrannosaur specimens found in the same localities as Alamosaurus aren't assigned to any species and remain unidentified. 
That being said, the specimens are said to be similar to a rex, and it's highly likely that Tyrannosaurus ventured this far south as well, though perhaps not so far south as to cross into the southern hemisphere. Tyrannosaurs would have been the only predators capable of hunting such a massive animal as Alamosaurus in the north, and even then, a full-grown adult would be difficult to kill, even for a rex. Many people also believe that Alamosaurus lived further north, however, there has been no evidence of this thus far. That being said, there is likely some overlap between animals like Alamosaurus and other North American fauna that typically lived up north, like that scene we saw on Prehistoric Planet involving Alamosaurus, a rex, and a pair of Quetzalcoatlus. Speaking of which, Quetzalcoatlus is actually fairly commonly found in the same areas as Alamosaurus, suggesting that the two enjoy the same type of environment, albeit for different reasons. The plains likely offered an abundance of shrubs and other plants that Alamosaurus may not have needed to compete as much for, as well as open areas for them to spot predators coming from further away. Quetzalcoatlus, on the other hand, likely enjoyed the open areas as easier places to find prey, spotting them more clearly and being able to strike with better accuracy. Alamosaurus was so common in the southern parts of the United States that it defined the ecosystems of the time, being at the top of the food chain that had lacked sauropods for so many generations. When one of these animals died, it was likely a veritable feast similar to elephant or whale carcasses today and was probably an important part of all sauropod ecosystems, feeding carnivores of all levels. Like other sauropods, they also likely terraformed, knocking trees over and shaping the forest near their plains as these were likely areas where they laid their eggs, offering the young a form of protection until they were old enough to fend for themselves and venture out to join the adults in herds. During this young stage of their life was when they were the most vulnerable, and we don't know much about the nesting habits of Alamosaurus. They likely had an abundance of young like the rest of their relatives, relying on strength and numbers to ensure the success of the next generation and their species. As I mentioned, after they reappeared, Alamosaurus dominated the landscape of the southern parts of North America and maintained this through the end of the Cretaceous. They were one of the most massive sauropods North America had ever seen, challenged by few others in sheer size. They defined the landscape and brought back the supremacy of their family after being absent for more than 30 million years. They were the last American Titans. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and thanks again for staying tuned and helping me reach both 200 and 300,000 subscribers. What kind of videos do you guys want to see next? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, have a fantastic day, be good people, and I'll see you guys in the next one.